Hello everyone, Stan Dane here. In our exoneration of Lee Harvey Oswald series of videos, we have presented a mountain of evidence that exculpates Lee Oswald as the sixth floor assassin of President John F. Kennedy. Some people find it hard to believe, but Oswald was set up to be a patsy by a corrupt system that included the Dallas police, the Texas courts, and the FBI. A heinous crime was committed and somebody had to be blamed, and quickly. The system picked Oswald for this honor. After Oswald was eliminated, the corruption continued unabated. Dallas County District Attorney Henry Wade was the face of this corrupt system in Dallas for many years. In this video, we'll examine the fruits of this corrupt system. We'll start with a brief look at what Henry Wade had to say during the weekend following the assassination. With me at Dallas Police Headquarters is District Attorney Henry Wade, whose job it will be to prosecute Lee Oswald, the man accused of killing President Kennedy. Mr. District Attorney, do you feel that you now have enough evidence to successfully prosecute Oswald? I think we have sufficient evidence at present to prove that he was the one that killed the president. Sufficient evidence? J. Edgar Hoover wasn't so sure. He told President Johnson on this very same day that, quote, the evidence that they have at the present time is not very, very strong. And will you ask death in the electric chair for Lee Oswald? Yes, sir. That was District Attorney Henry Wade, District Attorney of Dallas County. The purpose of this news conference is to detail some of the evidence against Oswald for the assassination of the president. This evidence was gathered by, largely by the Dallas police who did an excellent job on this with the help of some of the federal agencies. As, as all of you do know, first, there was a number, we have a number of witnesses that saw the person with the gun on the sixth floor of the bookstore building, the window detailing the window where he was looking out. Henry Wade was saying here that he had a number of witnesses who saw Oswald with a gun on the sixth floor at the window. Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry in 1969 said that in 1963, we are sure of our case against Oswald. Now he was no longer certain. Quoting here, We don't have any proof he fired the rifle, Curry said Wednesday. No one has been able to positively put him in that building with a gun in his hand. Would you be willing to say, with all this evidence, uh, that uh, it is now beyond a reasonable doubt at all that, uh, that uh, Oswald was the killer of President Kennedy? I would say that without any doubt, he's the killer. The law says beyond a reasonable doubt and to a moral certainty, which I, there's no question that he was the killer of President Kennedy. How would you evaluate the work of the Dallas police in investigating the death of the president? I think the Dallas police did an excellent job on this and before midnight on when he was killed, uh, had the man in custody and had sufficient evidence, what I think, to convict him. As far as you're concerned, the evidence you gave us, you, you could have convicted him. I've sent people to the electric chair on less. I believe you, Henry. Many believe you sent people to the electric chair for less. A day after Oswald was in custody, Henry Wade was saying with confidence that he had sufficient evidence to convict Oswald to kill him. Recall police captain Will Fritz telling reporters that the case was cinched only hours after Oswald's arrest. Wade never got the chance to send Oswald to the electric chair, but his justice system remained intact and flourished. What follows is a well-documented example of this. Let's review the case of Randall Dale Adams, the subject of the movie The Thin Blue Line. In October 1976, Adams, 27, 
left Ohio, ultimately intending to make it to California. He arrived in Dallas and planned to stay only a few days, but he got a job. A few weeks later, he was told there would be no work the Friday after Thanksgiving, but work on Saturday would be optional. When he showed up Saturday, there was no one at the job site. On the way home, his car ran out of fuel. David Ray Harris, 16, came by in a car that he had stolen from his neighbor in Vidor, Texas, before driving to Dallas with his father's pistol and a shotgun. Harris offered Adams a ride. The two spent the day together, during which they had some alcohol and pawned some items Harris had stolen. That evening, they went to a drive-in movie. Adams then returned to the motel where he was staying. Shortly after midnight, Robert W. Wood, a Dallas police officer and his partner, Teresa Turco, spotted Harris driving a blue car with no headlights. The officer stopped the car, and as Wood approached the driver's side, Harris shot him multiple times. Wood died on the spot. As the car sped off, Turco fired several shots but missed. She did not get a license number. She seemed certain that there was only one person in the car, the driver. Harris drove directly to his home in Vidor, 300 miles southeast of Dallas. Over the next several days, he bragged to his friends that he, quote, offed a pig, unquote, in Dallas. When police heard about this, they took Harris in for questioning. He denied having anything to do with a murder claim, and he was just talking to impress his friends. But when police told him that a ballistics test established that a pistol he had stolen from his father was a murder weapon, Harris changed his story. He now claimed that he had been present at the shooting, but that it had been committed by a hitchhiker he had picked up, Adams. Despite his young age, Harris had a history of run-ins with the law, but the Dallas police had a motive for believing him over Adams. When a police officer is murdered, authorities usually demand the most severe possible punishment, which in Texas, of course, was and is death. Harris was only 16 and ineligible for the death penalty. Adams was 27 and thus could be executed. At trial... Before Dallas County District Court Judge Don Metcalf and a jury, Teresa Turco testified that she had not seen the killer clearly, but that his hair was the color of Adams. She also said that the killer wore a coat with a fur collar. Harris had such a coat, but Adams did not. Adams emphatically denied having any knowledge of the crime. But then the prosecution sprang two surprises. The first was the introduction of Adams' purported signed statement which police and prosecutors claimed was a confession, although it said only falsely, according to Adams, that when he was in the car with Harris, they had at one point been near the crime scene. The second was a testimony of three purported eyewitnesses whose existence had, until then, been unknown to the defense. Michael Randall, Robert Miller, and Emily Miller. They claimed to have seen Adams at the scene. A lot of procedures were not properly followed during the course of the trial. For example, the weekend after their surprise testimony, the defense learned that Emily Miller had initially told police that the man she had seen appeared to be Mexican or a light-skinned African-American. When the defense asked to recall the Millers to testify, the prosecution claimed that the couple had left town. In fact, the Millers had only moved from one part of Dallas to another. When the defense asked to introduce Emily Miller's statement, the judge would not allow it. He said it would be unfair to impeach her credibility when she was unavailable for further examination. The defense was also very weak, almost incompetent. The jury quickly returned a verdict of guilty and turned to sentencing. Under Texas law, in order for Adams to be sentenced to death, the jury had to be convinced there was beyond a reasonable doubt probability he would commit similar acts of violence in the future. To establish that Adams met that criterion, the prosecution called Dr. James Grigson, a Dallas psychiatrist known as Dr. Death. 
Although the American Psychiatric Association has said on several occasions that future dangerousness was impossible to predict, Grigson testified that Adams would be dangerous unless executed. Grigson testified similarly in more than 100 other Texas cases that ended in death sentences. After hearing the psychiatrists, Adams' jury voted to sentence him to death. 21 months later, at the end of January 1979, the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals affirmed the conviction and death sentence. The execution was scheduled for May 8, 1979. Just three days before Adams was to be executed, U.S. Supreme Court Justice Lewis Powell Jr. ordered a stay. Powell was troubled over some issues with how the jury was selected. The Supreme Court's language meant that Adams was entitled to a new trial. But a few days later, Dallas County District Attorney Henry Wade announced that a new trial would be a waste of money, so he asked the governor to commute Adams' sentence to life in prison. When the governor promptly complied, Wade proclaimed that there would now be no need for a new trial. In March 1985, Errol Morris arrived in Dallas to work on a documentary about Griggs and Dr. Death. Morris's intent had not been to question the guilt of defendants in whose cases Grigson had testified, but only to question his psychiatric conclusions. When Morris met Adams, the focus of the project changed. Morris learned that Harris had not led an exemplary life after helping convict Adams. Harris had joined the Army and had been stationed in Germany where he had been convicted in a military court of a series of burglaries and sent to prison in Leavenworth, Kansas. A few months after his release, Harris had been convicted in California of kidnapping, armed robbery, and related crimes. After his release from prison in California and five months after Morris arrived in Dallas, Harris tried to kidnap a young woman in Beaumont, Texas, In an effort to prevent the abduction, her boyfriend, Mark Mays, exchanged gunfire with Harris. Mays was shot to death and Harris was wounded. For the Mays murder, a crime that would not have occurred if Dallas authorities had convicted the actual killer of Officer Wood eight years earlier, Harris was sentenced to death. Meanwhile, Morris discovered that Officer Turco had been hypnotized and otherwise pressured during the investigation and initially had acknowledged that she had not seen the killer, facts that the prosecution had illegally withheld from the defense. Morris also found that robbery charges against the daughter of eyewitness Emily Miller had been dropped by the judge after Miller agreed to identify Adams as Woods' killer. The new information, coupled with the fact that Miller initially had described the killer as Mexican or African American, became the basis for a new trial motion. In 1988, during a hearing on the motion, Harris, now on death row, recanted admitting his role in the shooting of Woods. It wasn't long after this that Adams was released and all charges against him dropped. Harris was never tried for the murder of Officer Woods because on June 30, 2004, he was executed for the murder of Mark Mays. Henry Wade fostered a win-at-all-cost culture during his tenure as Dallas County District Attorney. He never let a good fact get in the way of a bad conviction. Just win, baby. After Henry Wade retired, a lot of his murder convictions began to be overturned. Nice legacy, Henry. The Dallas police had a lot of problems as well. And speaking about misconduct and errors, there's the FBI. What have we just seen? 
In the case of Randall Adams, we saw perjured testimony, misleading witness accounts, police, attorney, and judicial misconduct, resulting in an innocent man getting put on death row and barely getting out alive. Only through the heroic actions of one man, Errol Morris, did Adams escape a horrible fate. But what about Mark Mays? Because the system was so broken and didn't give a damn about the truth, they didn't pursue the obvious killer for Officer Wood. Mays is dead. That blood is on their hands. We've also taken a tip of the iceberg glimpse at some of the serious problems with the Dallas police and the FBI. The Dallas system that dealt with Oswald was clearly corrupt and defective. When they realized they couldn't pull off their typical shenanigans a la Randall Adams, they adjusted their tactics. They might have silenced Oswald, but they haven't silenced the truth. It's alive and well, and it will eventually come out. Until next time, this is Stan Dane, and as always, keep on rocking.